So welcome to the AFT Construction Podcast, and today we have Jamie Rose with us. So welcome, Jamie. Thank you. And Jamie, this is actually her first podcast, although she has a huge resume of broadcasts, which is a little bit different than what we're doing here today. <laughs> it's my first podcast, but not my first broadcast, but I like this better. We're no gonna, one can see my hair. Yeah, and we're going to get into that with her background in journalism, which, you know, and how that's catapulted her career in the interior design business. And we have an amazing project together that we'll get into as well later. But but I think what's really important for the listeners, I mean, we talk a lot about how do you scale your business? How do you grow? How do you create systems, right? And what's funny is when you and I met, we met through Instagram. Um, we met at your office, and this is a few years back. I mean, it's probably three years now. And at the time, I remember going to your office in a pretty small, great location in town, and it was <laughs> you and you know, you're outsourcing a few things or four of you. And now here you are fast forward and you have 13. I mean, it's amazing the growth that you've had. So, you know, how, how have you managed that growth to go from four to 13 in such a short time? Well, thank you. And yes, I fully stalked you on Instagram and was like, <laughs> Brad, I want to work together. So all of y'all doing that, sometimes it works. Well, it does. Well, <laughs> if I interrupt you, it's funny, before we get to the growth, you know, you always talk about, you know, I have people reach out and they're like, hey, Brad, well, you know, I'm soliciting or I'm reaching out, just DMing someone and they don't respond. But what's unique is like, you never did that. You never sent me a DM. You just said, hey, Brad, I have a job. I think you'd be perfect. Come meet me. Are you available? And so totally different response, right? It wasn't can I work for you? It's like, I have a job, come with me. And so you're luring me in, which is a technique I've had to use with some of designers such as yourself and <laughs> architects to, from my side. So it's a great technique to kind of navigate that social media. Well, yes, you have to, it has to go both ways. You can't just ask, you have to give, right? Mm -hmm. So the question about managing growth is that we decided to grow. We made a very conscious decision that we wanted to level up, you know, like the song. And we started looking for people that had amazing skills who could do the 3D interior renderings, which, you know, technically I can do, but I'm really slow, so <laughs> they don't let me. But we made a very conscious decision, and we made systems that helped back us up. We have, you know, before our clients ever walk in the front door, we know what we're doing in all eight design meetings. Like, we have a plan, and we are executing. <laughs> so I want to get into this. You mentioned the eight design meetings. So is that pretty common for your clients, or where did you come up with that? that number it's, it's six to eight depending and sometimes nine ten if it's a really big project like the one that you and I have together but we know about how long a client has a uh, attention span to <laughs> make it through the meeting and we know how much we can get done in that time and we know how big the house is so when we sign the project we sit down together as a team and we make a list okay here's what we're doing in meeting one two three four five six and sometimes you know, seven, eight, nine, ten. We always start with the kitchen, always. We move on to the master bathroom. But we have a very great system that supports us and works and helps our clients move through the house internally in their minds because they're doing that. And so it helps if you take their hand and walk them through. And it also is important, I think, uh, to manage your client's expectations. And so when they hire you and they, you know, you ask for a big deposit and they give it to you, it helps if you tell them, great, okay, here's what to expect. Here's how this is going to work. Now, I like how you do that, Jamie. So really, from a design perspective, you're not saying, okay, today we're going to tackle appliances. You know, the next appointment, we're going to tackle plumbing fixtures and hardware. It's more, no, we're going to go at the kitchen. In fact, we fully designed your kitchen. It's rendered. I mean, I've seen that, but <laughs> I'm just for the listeners who are listening to this. So that's the target approach is it's room by room and everything's inclusive in that design at that meeting. It is. So before we ever start with the clients, we have something that we call our North Star onboarding process where we sit down and discuss every photo they've ever saved on their phone, every photo they've ever saved on Instagram. And we talk through them with the clients and ask them, okay, what is it that you love about this? What are you responding to here? And we spend a couple hours in that meeting. And by the time we have reached the end of that meeting, we know what direction we're walking in. And that really sets us apart in terms of being able to design a finished kitchen. And with the 3D renderings that we do, we can like, okay, well, here's your kitchen if it was white. Here's your kitchen if it was black. Here's your kitchen if it was wood. And that's a fun little trick that we have now. I love how you do that. And, and one of the things that you mentioned is the North Star. I think that's a great piece of terminology that I think I'm going to have to use in the future. But, <laughs> you know, it's just a, a great way to really understand the client. And, I, you know, to speak to that, I know sitting in these meetings with you at pre-construction, one of my favorite things that I picked up from you is that you tell the client, look, live how you are for two weeks. Don't clean your house. If you have a house cleaner, don't send them. And that way I'm going to come walk your house. And it's not to inspect how clean they are. It's more, 
Where's your drop zones? Where are you putting your keys? Where are you putting your shoes? You know, how messy is your closet? Like, where are you storing stuff on your countertop so that you can really see how they live, which gives you almost a head start to design their new house? It does, and it really helps us help them in their house because I believe that your house should work for you. It's like your staff member that you pay the very most because how much is that mortgage? A good design really can help you live better and we can look at the house and walk it together and identify all those pain points and where your husband puts his shoes and what's driving you crazy and fix them if we have the opportunity to see it. See, and how do you respond? Because I'm sure you get um, clients that will say, okay, and we're not going to get into specifics of your fee, but you present your fee, you present your bid or proposal, if you will, for the work to be done, your services. And they say, oh, Jamie, like, you know, I was hoping to be here or, you know, this is here. I mean, how do you help them understand the value, you know, that you're bringing as a designer to their project? So when we start a project or when we're meeting with a potential client, we walk them through our spec book, which is kind of, I think, one of the key secrets to my success, especially with builders, because that's where we get a lot of our business. Brad is from builders like you, and thank you, by the way, for that, and from architects and from realtors who have seen the, the level of detail that we bring to our spec books and how it makes the project go faster, which, by the way, saves the client money, which they love. So we walk them through page by page. We show them every detail until their eyes cross a little, and they're like, please, please help me with my house. And of course, we're going to make it look beautiful, but I think that needs to go without saying. I also talk to them about how important it is to me that their house feels like them and how the and I walk them through the steps that I take with my team to make sure that that happens that it's not a Jamie Rose house which is not what I want people to say I want people to walk in and say oh my gosh this house feels like you I see your family on the walls I see pieces of your you know memories from your honeymoon and a coffee table book of the first trip you took together like we really try to personalize I love that. And it's funny because just uh, a little prop to you is when I was on Luann's podcast from a well-designed business, she's had me a few times. And one of the big focuses is that builder designer relationship. And of course, the spec book we'll get into. <laughs> and I always use the term A plus spec book. You know, I've had a lot of designers around the country reach out like, Brad, what is that? At? And I said, well, just talk to Jamie. Like she has the A plus spec book. I mean, this is really what you're providing for those listening is full depth, you know, everything from paint to grout to tile selections, renderings, you know, CAD, which is huge for us because this is what we build on. I mean, think about it. Our architects are going to provide the exterior drawings and details, but you're providing all the interior details and drawings that help us execute, you know, the vision. Thank you. I mean, it is it, the spec book that we provide is hundreds of pages. Literally and hundreds. <laughs> I mean, books, maybe three books for one project we have. Well, that project is 25,000 yeah. square feet. It's like three so. five-inch binders. But. So, but... We just, I think about it from a practical standpoint. If I had to build this, you know, my dad is a builder. What do I need to know? There's a lot that I need to know. And we and, try to answer all your questions. Yeah, and I think what's important, you know, for clients that listen or even builders and designers that are trying to understand how to navigate that question from the client, when you think about some points that you made, well, having a designer, they're going to live better, right? Which is something you stated. So th there is value to coming home, working a long day, traveling, whatever your business is. And you come home to this sanctuary where there's comfort it feels good, it's comfortable, it looks good, it inspires you, it relaxes you, right? These these are values. This is why people work hard and want to have this this situation. You look at resell. Um, I noticed that, you know, a lot of the projects we have with designers, you know, they resell better. So even though the clients are investing up front, like that is paid back for them in the end. And then also when you talk about the design book, well, this allows us now to get better pricing because we can price it out to multiple contractors. I don't have to go to one kitchen and bath showroom. And now we're locked into them designing the cabinet drawings and giving us their options. No, Jamie's done that. She's done all my cabinet drawings so I can send it out to ABC cabinet companies, which now gives the best price to my customer anyways. Which is what we want. You know, we tell our potential clients in our meetings, we, we will pay, f we, you will, we will get you your feedback, feedback many times over. And we really do. It's in the speed. It's in the ability to bid. We have done all the cabinet drawings. We do we draw every tile drawing. There's no room for error on in the trades, which I think also helps you. It helps us a lot. If they make an error, then you know you can say, "Hey, well, guess it was what? all there." You had Jamie already had it dialed in, <laughs> and I think that's a big thing too. I mean, the fourth point to that is that, as you mentioned, it takes the stress for the client, especially a first time buyer that's doing the first house they've ever done it takes that stress and overwhelming anxiety of making selections and picking everything because there's so much to the house building a house is hard and it stresses people out and they walk in and they're like oh my gosh how are we going to get through this and 
one of the biggest skills that you can bring a client as a designer is utter and complete confidence. Like, I got you. I have this. We're going to walk you through it. We do it all day, every day. It's no problem. It's easy. And you just have to remain calm and, and confident and excited. And it works. And I think that's true for any business owners, that confidence. So how, what, what would you attest to your confidence level, Jamie? Because you're fairly new. I mean, I shouldn't say fairly new, but I mean, it's not like you've been a designer your entire life. And now you have this incredible firm, 13, uh, you know, members, as we mentioned, and you have this confidence when you speak to the clients. So where does that come from? And, you know, where, what's the backing behind that? Well, as you mentioned, I used to be a journalist. I was a reporter for the news paper for the Arizona Republic, USA Today, the LA Times. And then I also had to do broadcast work, like live from the space shuttle launch at midnight. You know, I did that. <laughs> and so you get a lot of confidence doing that because you're smiling and people are looking at you. So you better act like you know what you're saying, you know. But also, to be honest, design is a is an instinct that I have. It isn't hard for me. I know the way. I know what direction we want to go. I also, as a journalist, have a lot of training in reading human emotions and the signals that they're sending without saying words. So if the client isn't happy, even if they're not telling me, I can tell. And we never come to a meeting with just one concept. We always come prepared with a couple ideas so we can pivot if they're not happy because we tell everyone in every meeting, finishes don't have feelings. You do, and yours matter to me. I love that. And I think that's really important, you know, for any business owner, you talk about preparation, you know, whether it be public speaking, whether it be owning a company, whether the confidence behind that, you're not going to have that unless you're prepared. If you know the product, if you know the content, you're going to be more direct and assertive and you're going to have this confidence behind you that people gravitate to. And I think that's important. I, you know, we always speak with other designers and builders and architects and all of us say the same thing. We should have taken a communications class in college we should have taken a psychiatry class maybe counseling class you know because a lot of our process not just with clients but with each other with our trade partners suppliers right all of us are trying to navigate construction and design and it's a very tough industry there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of inconsistencies and there's a lot of hands that get involved and people i mean on our projects one now i mean we probably have 5,000 people that'll touch and handle this house at some point. So there's a lot of room for error in us, unless you're communicating well and documented, as you mentioned, a lot of things can fall through the cracks. Yes. And if you walk into a meeting and, you, and the client asks you a question and you say, well, I'm not sure we could go this way or that way, you're dead. You're dead in the water. You have to say, answer their question or say, that needs further analysis and I will get back to you. Yeah. But you're just, you know, there's, a, there's a few key phrases I've learned by messing up a time or two. But yeah, it's very important. It's expensive, it's hard, and you are their guide. And you've got to be there for them at all times. You know, all of my clients, they have my cell phone number. They, I'm there for them when they need me. So that that's a good movement here in the conversation because when you think about growing your firm, right, Jamie Rose Interiors, you have this, this name, this brand, you yourself, Jamie, but you can't be everywhere. You can't design everything yourself as far as CAD and do all the back end work, right? With all the projects that you have happening. So when a client says, I'm hiring Jamie Rose, I want you totally involved. I mean, how do you navigate that conversation with the client to understand that they are getting Jamie Rose and your team, but there's a balance there? It's a great question, an important one. And our, our clients do ask that. They are still getting me creatively. I still, I'm a control freak and I work like a nut banshee person. So they are still getting my creativity. But I tell them in the meetings that I have a team that backs me up. They will have a project manager who they will get to know who will reach out to them with little questions like, what is your height? You know, things that we need to know and help them with scheduling. And they will also help us with the AutoCAD drawings and filling out the many, many pages of finished schedule spreadsheets. But creatively, nothing that we show them doesn't have my stamp or my touch. And most of the time, I've mostly done it. Which makes sense. I mean, I know from firsthand that you are very involved in the design process, but from the back end side, you know, as you've set these up, you have eight meetings. We're going to talk about the kitchen and meeting one and, you know, master suite and, and meeting two and so forth. Well, at these meetings, then your creative team, your project manager and your designers and those who are doing CAD, they're going to put together some options, A, B, and C for the client. And then you're going to come in and look at those A, B, and C and then put your flavor on them, if you will, or make the changes that you feel is adequate for this client. 
Yes, every project has a lead designer, and sometimes they are going to take the lead, and I'm going to come in and mess with their work, as we like to joke <laughs> around in the office. And sometimes the, I'm the lead, and I'm the one who is designed it from the inside out. But I, you know, I still I just I can't let go. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> someday maybe I'll have to. Right now, no, can't. <laughs> So, so let me ask this then, if you can't let go, which I have a hard time, I think most of us do that own a company because we put so much blood, sweat and tears and, you know, I, I, I didn't realize as an employee years ago, how stressful it is being a business owner, right? Because there's so much more to think about from cash flow and business development and marketing and customer service and then training and employees and hiring. And you know, the list goes on, we could talk about this forever. And so how do you keep, well, every time you hire someone, we talk about this, that you now are, you know, you're farther away from who you are and your vision, your personality of what you see. So how do you keep that close to the vest as far as training and educating your team at Jamie Rose? It is hard and we struggle with it. They, they joke, my team jokes that like, we, I have these absolutes like Jamie doesn't like shiny things or Jamie won't let you do, you know, blue cabinets. And then <laughs> like the next day I'll be like, did you guys see this blue cabinet on Instagram? I love it. And they're like, we hate you. <laughs> but they don't really. It's, it is hard. It is really hard to balance all of that. And I try to educate them. We sit down and we go through their work together and I talk to them about what I changed and why I changed it and try to really help them understand where I'm coming from. I'm always saving photos for them, like, okay, here's the North Star f that the client gave us, here's our augmentation of that, because we do definitely build on the client's concepts, because we want, that's, I think, important for us to surprise them a little and push them out of their comfort zone. But it isn't easy, it isn't easy to balance all of the hats that we have to wear as business owners. So you almost have an in-house, we'll call it an idea book, or whether it be Pinterest or Hauser Instagram, that the client has a North Star of what they like not that they think they like but what they like and sometimes mm -hmm. those styles can vary but then you're interpreting that into your style and you're keeping that in house so then that way at least your team has a guidance of of where the direction should be we have a secret file that the clients don't <laughs> see and then we bring those out when we're presenting to them they show they've shown us what they've seen but of course they don't have the access that we have to amazing work that we see all across the country and they're not paying attention to it every second of every day like we are so we always try to just edge them up a little and be, help them be more progressive and more classic, which is important to me also. So it's interesting, you know, you think most industries they have continuing education, right? So a legal, you know, lawyer, they're gonna uh, go to continuing education, you know, CPA, you know, our accounting, you know, they're gonna be up to date on tax. And I think about it for us as a builder, well, I need to be up to date on what's the new technology, what's the right installation practice, you know, how should we, waterproof our window install and flash it properly. And all these things are out there from a designer. I mean, you have that element too, but you also have to say, what's current? What are people gravitating to? What are some of the styles? And so are you used to, how much time do you spend a week researching worldwide, industry-wide things that can enhance your brand? I, I bet I spend three to four hours a day wow. looking at things for inspiration point. And then I travel a lot. Well, I used to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I take photos Constantly. I mean, we went to market last weekend in Atlanta and I took 900 photos a day of things that I saw for projects. Like that's how many there were because I had to put them in the shared album for my team. And it's important to just, you know, Diana Vreeland, I think it said, I think it was, she said the eye has to travel and mine does. I have to find constant inspiration. And Pinterest isn't always the best place to go because Everyone else has seen that, and we want to be new and fresh and exciting. And so we look for um, restaurant design. That's a great place to find inspiration. Commercial projects that are in Europe, those are hot spots for me for total eye candy. So how do you organize this? I'm thinking in my head, 900 photos a day. <laughs> there has to be, and you're taking photos of your project. I mean, progress, you know, there's Instagram that we'll get into later and social media, but how is there... A, a way behind the management of all these photos of how you're documenting and organizing because if you take 900 photos and you have 15 clients well they may have you know a certain amount of photos per project so how how do you organize that well that definitely needs further analysis <laughs> <laughs> I think my team would give me an F on the photo organization. <laughs> Basically, it's they help me, and they are, it's a little frustrating, and we definitely need a better system. So it's interesting. I had Danny Wing on with Danny Wing Design, and we actually spoke about this, and he said what he does. He has an iPhone, and he actually creates albums immediately. So if he's at a certain project, 
he'll start the album and he'll take those photos. So simultaneously as he's going through the day or he's finding inspiration, he creates all these albums. So he does have endless albums, but that's how he's done it, which I need to do better at. That's one thing where I'll go and I'll take a lot of videos and photos of projects and progress and content. And then I go to do stories later, you know, with our busy schedule, trying to make time for that. And then I'm like, well, where did I put those photos? <laughs> where are they? And in the meantime, I photo my kids or family or other things going on. And you're trying to navigate that. We have, we do have albums, but definitely I need to be better at putting them in the photos in. And I think probably someone else in my office needs to be in charge of that. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, you can't do everything. And I think this is important. When you talked about hiring, you said we've been very targeted. We've been very, look, you know, specializing in certain attributes. So there's a lot of work. Anyone that knows when you hire someone, all of the job applications and resumes and then they come in and then you have to invest in them to be successful and give them the tools and resources, whether it be, you know, laptops and phones and all this and all the software, you know, and then there's that, that lead way. So you're going from four to 13. And so when you're hiring, are you really targeted to say, you know what, we have to have someone that's good at CAD design. We have to have someone that has a great eye for design. That's not as technical. You know, how involved do you get in creating that job scope when you're looking to bring someone on? When we are looking, we always identify, okay, where are we suffering? You know, for a couple of hires, it was, we need help with AutoCAD, major help with AutoCAD. But now I do require that all of the people on our design team know AutoCAD. You have to be able to open it, move around in it. Uh, Now we want people to also know SketchUp and how to do 3D drafting, because I think that is a very important tool, especially moving forward. I look for somebody who has a great work ethic. I have a, a little bit of a, I think, unbalanced work (laughs) but that's important to me that I think they're going to work hard I look for them to be excited and I just look for a spark of magic like we click I like them I trust them and actually that's probably the most important thing is that when I meet them I feel like I'm in good hands well and it's just a gut thing I guess yeah it goes back to what we're talking about I mean they're they're an arm of you right and so if they have your same personality and they're good communicating with the clients and your customers and your contractors. These are important because this is your name that's out there. And the spark of magic, I like that term. You know, I think the company culture, we've looked at that. The experience is really important. I like that you're more real rounded. We're looking at can you do SketchUp, you know, chief architect or CAD, you know, do you understand this software? And then not that you can't train and help enhance that talent, but at least there's a base there and then the personality is a big part of that. It's important. And then I also, in more recent hires, because I'm having to take my hands off the design a little bit, I've also been looking for people whose aesthetic inspires me or aligns with what I'm looking for. Which is awesome. And I love that you talked about your inspiration from, you know, restaurants, commercial, you know, restaurants in Europe and hotels and, you know, a lot of these things that are happening around the country because or around the world, I should say, because I've seen that. I've seen how that influence is part of your design, which is why it's so unique. It's not this standard. Uh, I don't want to say recycled, but, you know, there's material that goes around that a lot of people will use, whereas you have a lot of elements to your design that are so different. So that makes sense that that's where you get some of your inspiration. Well, thank you. The projects that I've had with you have been in, interesting and the clients were both very brave and they were like no we want something we've never seen before like one of our clients who I adore said I don't even want like a towel hook I've seen before so all of her towel hooks are custom and we got a lot of ideas from hotels that yeah. I've stayed in around the world but it's fun to have a client who trusts you sometimes we get clients who want what everyone else has and we try to make it a little different so how do you manage because we can talk about this we have a very exciting project and of course we're not going to speak about the clients or, or where it's at but it, it's an amazing project for both of us we're super excited about it and so how did you manage the clients from your side of things to say okay we have 12 13 bathrooms <laughs> you know we're going to have fun with each one and here's my creativity because you have some designs in each of these bathrooms that are completely different than other bathrooms throughout the house so how did they say jamie we trust you go get it well the clients are fantastic they just have this great energy and they want to be different and they want to be brave and they want to be bold they also travel and they just said we'd shown them a couple things that were safe and then she was like no 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 like i've seen that before i've seen that faucet before so they pushed us which was great because once we got the 
understanding that they wanted what they wanted and that what they wanted was to be surprised, we went for it. I mean, we did like, I saw a, um, well, I think it was a towel rack display in a department store in London that became a bathroom vanity that, you know, it was some crazy in- extraction and in- interpreting that made that come true. And the client's as we built through these 13 bathrooms, which is how many there were, and mm-hmm. three kitchens, by the end, they were just excited to see what I would come up with next. And like I wasn't able to totally show them what we were doing, but they got the concepts and trusted and was excited. Well, I think that's really neat for anyone on the creative side when you think about, well, here's one vanity in one custom house that was inspired from a towel bar in London, a multiple towel bar, right? In London. And here that's transpired into one vanity. And so you think about the process and understanding and creative direction to make that happen. I think that's a lot more than people realize, which goes behind your designs. Well, thank you. I mean, I I see these things and I'm like, okay, that could be this. I guess that's just uh, the creative eye. What could that be? Or I love that. What could that be? One of their powder room was like a sink that was in the back of a restaurant. And I was like, that's cool. Let's make that into a powder room. I mean, I just responded to it, saved the photo, and then dragged it out. So <laughs> I'm. It, it's funny because I'm not a designer, but I think from the contractor side, you know, when we travel, my wife and I and kids, you know, I'm always looking at, you know, I'll walk into a hotel or uh, an airport or wherever, and I look at the construction, and I'm like, this is so much work to do this. I know the, the sw- sweat, blood, and tears by the contractor that had to go through and build this because having worked at – one of the signature hotels here in town for three years, it's backbreaking in a way. There's so much detail. The time frames are tight, you know, because every day you're late, liquidated damages, like there's money on the line. And when you're in that commercial world, it's really tough. But to think about, you know, going and finding a sink in the back kitchen at some restaurant in London, well, that can inspire my future design. I mean, it's fascinating to be looking at things at that depth and, and detail. Well, and then we can't think of things like that. Like, I haven't been able to bring those ideas to every project. And so it's so important to have a great build partner who I can bring these insane (laughs) ideas to and who I know will like absolutely nail them 100,000%. Well, that's the hard hard part. You have the creative idea and now it's like, well, who's going to build it? Who's going to make this? Who's going to manufacture it? And that's that's the custom side is having the right people in line that can now do that custom furniture for a vanity or do the custom metalwork and ironwork, which... You know, unfortunately, there's not as many of those talented craftsmen out there. And that's one of the things that we deal with as as a builder. Yes. And all projects aren't that crazy. Like there are plenty of projects where we've designed beautiful vanities that come from a cabinet company. But it's great to have the option and the ability to translate some insane idea that you have with an incredible team. So who's managing your social media? That is such a good question. So I read um, an article by or an interview with the Barefoot Contessa, Ina Garten, a few years ago and she said you know she's how big is her brand she's incredible and she said everything I put on Instagram is me it's always me people want me and I thought okay all right so that's still me I do have my sister helping me with comments and DMs and managing that because she sounds like me I trust her (laughs) and she's a mom at home all day and loves to be on Instagram (laughs) So that works well, but still every post is coming from me. And I also think that's important. And I also, you know, have that journalism background. So writing isn't, it's not hard. It's easy. It's fast. I don't need to spell check. I got that all trained into my brain, forwards and backwards and sideways. So it's me. I love that. And there's so much time that goes behind social media. I know because I run ours as well. Uh, But what's funny is I had Randy Garrett on and she said the same thing. You know, Randy said, I focus my social media on things that are most important to our brand or to our lead generation. So she looks at it like I have Instagram and that's been a huge catapult for my business. So I'm going to run that. Whereas some of these other social media platforms aren't as uh, comprehensive to the lead generation and sponsorships and other collaborations she's doing. And so she can delegate that, right? Because you only have so much time in a day. And I found, you know, one thing that I'm lacking is Pinterest. I need to figure out Pinterest because it's such a valuable arm. And I know from the design world, you know, there's a lot of value to blogging and Pinterest and and how that can, you know, cross collaborate with the other platforms that help build your brand. I mean, yes, you're right. I need to do much more on Pinterest. I need to pay attention to Facebook. I need to get on LinkedIn and 
figure it out. I mean, I have an account. I'm completely 100,000% focused on Instagram because it brings me so much work. But diversification is necessary. And who would have <laughs> thought that Instagram would be that powerful? I never would have thought. And I get, I, we just got a project in Lake Tahoe. We just got an incredible project in Greenwich, Connecticut from people who found us on Instagram. So this is important because, you know, I, I speak to people about leveraging their brand, you know, with, you know, influencers. It's really important if you can find an influencer and, you know, you, you use the term loss leader in sales. So even if you may not have a big financial windfall or downfall from, from a big project, but there may be an investment from your side. You're doing something at a discount for an influencer because of their audience and how that can build. And I've seen your work, you know, I've seen your growth so fast, you're gonna pass me pretty soon on Instagram. <laughs> no. But you've been reposted by some really big accounts and some people that I follow and have built a, a, a good network with and they're reposting your stuff. And then now you're doing some work for some big influencers in Utah. So how did that relationship start with those influencers out of state? Well, they found me on Instagram. We put a lot of time and money into our photography. I mean, a lot, it is hugely important and that's what has generated our instagram feed and the the influencers who i can name um rachel parcel of pink peonies and emily jackson of the ivory or of ivl collection their sisters and they found me on instagram and they were they dm'd me for a couple emily dm'd me for a couple years and i was like oh wouldn't that be something and then when they called i mean i think we were literally dancing around the office i called you and <laughs> yeah, i was you like did. Ah, <laughs> guess what we were so thrilled and it's been a such a pleasure to work with them they're brave they want to be edgy and new and fun and different and they love design so it's been a really enjoyable process well it's funny you say that because i say all the time you know when people starting their business you know where should i focus and there's a lot of focuses but photography is so key how can you capture the work that you're doing and if you don't have good photography it will not hit and especially on a platform such as instagram that's very competitive uh, you know, there's a lot of people that don't have the attention span and Instagram tracks that as we all know. Mm -hmm. So if you have good content and it's reshared and reposted, that's how you're going to get your product in front of so many eyeballs around the country. The photography is the entire key. I, we have a photographer who I've worked with since my first project and I tell him all the time, like he is the secret to my success and I couldn't do it without him and I can't. Yeah. And so how have you seen the brand escalate now with some of the collaborations you're doing with uh, Rachel Parcell and her sister and, you know, now some of these other, uh, you know, people that I've had on podcast that repost your work, like Amy at MM Lighting. She's a huge fan. She posts a lot of your work, so which is pretty exciting. I love her. Um, we, it's, we're growing quickly on Instagram. It's, you, I think we like hit 10,000 and then it just quickly, quickly escalated and we're almost to 50, which I'm so excited about. With um, Rachel and Emily, I think it's, it's grown a lot, but it's going to really hit when the projects are finished. Because so. that's the fun part. That's when you get to photograph it and, and publish it. And then now they're resharing it and tagging you. And so now you have that exposure to that demographic, which is really the key of marketing. It's how can you get the Jamie Rose name out there? And although it's not free because there's a lot of time, but in essence, if you put the time behind it, you, it will build. Yeah, we, we are excited about it. And the, pro the design is edgy. It's out there. So that's fun. That's amazing. So, you know, when you talk about Instagram, how has that changed your business? You know, looking back before, you know, we understand the lead generations are coming now and you've built that audience. You know, where did you find work leaving journalism? I'm starting Jamie Rose. I mean, how did you even start that transition to build your company, which is the hardest thing? It was so scary. But when I was, I was so scared. I was so scared. I um, always loved design. My mom was a designer. My dad is a class A contractor. So like bridges and roads. And I don't know what I was thinking with journalism, but I was very serious about <laughs> it for a very long time. But I was doing design on the side. I was picking paint colors for my editors at lunchtime and, um, you know, going over to my colleague's house after work and hanging a gallery wall. Like I was obsessed. So it was just like, well, yeah, I'm going to do this now. I had a, a baseball player, a big one, come to me and say who I was friends with and say, hey, will you do my house? And I said, no, I don't, I don't do that. And uh, he said, well, I'll give you my credit card. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll, yeah. I'll do that. <laughs> and so that's how it started. And then, you know, more baseball players came and more people in their neighborhood, which was affluent. And then it wasn't a side thing anymore. It was a, a real thing. And so I am grateful to them. And then I had a couple builders who gave me a shot, um, one of whom I went to kindergarten with. I'm grateful to him. And I just kind of figured it out as I went at the beginning, to be honest with you. And I went back to school to learn AutoCAD and 
at age 38 and like fully cried in the bathroom on the first day because it was hard to be there with all these young kids and here you are going back I felt so stupid and I just was like oh my gosh like I was a Pulitzer finalist which I was and here I am like in school again and it was an ego blow (laughs) but I'm glad I did it yeah that's a huge transition you know you talk about you know the the connection right how you build that bandwidth that ripple effect and even though you were in a different career path I mean completely different right you're in journalism and, you know, you're reporting and doing all the back end. And, but as you alluded, you know, you're building relationships with that career, right? And, and that may not have been important at the time to some extent, but it's amazing how those relationships you built early in your career have now catapulted the growth now at this stage. Yes, and I still have, I had a column for the newspaper and I still have, I have clients who read that column and when they heard that I transitioned to, to design, reached out because they loved that girl in that column. And so it did help. And it also taught me about um, learning about people and that all businesses are about people and that, you know, I wrote about people. I was a human interest reporter. And when you really focus on people, that makes you more interesting to them and more valuable to them because they know that you're totally focused on their needs at all times, which well, we are. Yeah, and if they know you care and that you're – you're engaged and you want, you know, you're emotionally involved with them because this is an emotional decision. It's a big investment. If they feel that and see that, they're going to be more prone to hire you anyways. It's important that you show them that you care and that you do care and that they know that all the time. You know, if we hear from a client on a day that they need help, like we are there for them. If they are having a nervous breakdown, which every client does in the process of a build (laughs) at one point, you know, we have our, you know, Jennifer Lopez in the wedding planner (laughs) speech, like, you're beautiful. Your husband loves you. You know, we, we have a talk. We give them. We're like, we know where you are. This happens to everybody. It, this is hard. But guess what? Like, the things that are happening are normal. And it's all going to be great. And in two months, you will not remember any of this. And you'll just be happy. Yeah, we found that that's a skill we've had to refine for our team and ourselves over the years. Because in construction, I can tell you our phase of that. So everything's great the honeymoon stage in the beginning and pre-construction and we start and there's equipment out there and we're moving and doing retaining walls it's super exciting but you get to the point in the project where you're nearing completion you know cabinets are in countertops you're starting to put in trim and wood flooring you know all these things are going in and so there's a lot of people in the house we don't paint till the end so it's not painted it's not although we try to keep our job sites clean there's still a lot of dust it's hard to keep it totally clean because a lot of people are in there and the clients, like, they have this panic attack because they're like, here we are at the end, and we're coming to the end. It's not going to be ready. The quality's not going to be there. And, you know, it's like, well, hold on. You know, it's hard to explain this, but the minute we get all the RAM board out and countertop protection and all the tape, all, you know, all, all the coverings that we have on the thresholds and we get this clean and the tape off the windows, once it's cleaned and painted, it's going to look totally different, you know, and it's hard for them to see that, but, but we go through that. That seems to be our biggest pain point. I think it's everybody's in this in our industry. That ending, that three quarter or five six of the way yeah. through panic attack, and they all have it. And we do tell them like, "This is going to happen to you. You're going to walk in and be like, that's wrong. That's not what I picked.' Or, oh, I don't know if it's going to look good together.' And we say, "Call us. We'll talk you through it." You know, you just have to again project total confidence, total calm. Like, give them a safe place to land. Talk them through it. You know, we will send a bottle of champagne to their house at night if we think that will help. I mean, anything just to tell them, hey, you know, it will be okay. I love that. And so from a builder side or architect, you've worked with a lot of builders and and architects in town and out of town, of course, now. So what would you say makes that relationship better, whether builder or architect that, help your, that helps your process? Well, I mean, from a build standpoint, I mean, we, you know, we think the absolute world of you you come to every meeting you're involved in the design process you're seeing where we're going to be creating pitfalls or you're seeing where okay this is going to be hard let's work on this together and we know that we have in you like a true partner who wants the best for our client who's going to find the best way to do it the most affordable way the the way that's going to give the longest lasting quality and that you're totally dedicated to carrying out our designs that is very rare like extremely like hey you (laughs) nice to meet you um and so and then there are other builders who are great but they're like well can we you know sub this out or i was this is almost what you wanted i'm like 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that kind of stresses me out. And just responsiveness. You know, we know who to call. You always get back to us quickly. And that's so important. And then with an architect, we have worked with great architects and the ones who are the best are also totally paying attention to the clients and they leave their ego at the door and they're listening and they are trying to make the clients happy and are listening when they and un- when the clients say I only I only want to carry my carry my groceries when I walk into the garage I want to walk seven feet like they they care and they and they also treat us with respect and understand that we are here to help them we are partners and when you have a architect and a builder and a designer all working together as partners who trust each other and admire each other, you get the very best result. And I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's really valuable. I think for any new company, whether you're a designer, architect, builder, and you made some points here, Jamie, you said, you know, if, if, if the team or the company is focused on the client and what they want, you know, that's going to show. And then you mentioned that uh, responsiveness, communication, if they're answering emails and texts and not leaving you hanging or and and if they're building actually what the design book tells us we should build and not is this almost what you wanted is pretty close but we're not making substitutions we're asking you questions and then i think one of the big points that you made is no ego and and that's hard to do i think that's hard for anybody we take pride in what we do um and and there's a confidence to what we do as you mentioned but you have to leave your ego out the door right this is a team i i have to make sure that you know, Jamie's our number one priority and our architect is because if they're good and happy, my life will be happy and then we can get the project where it needs to go. Yes, and I also have to listen to you and you say, great idea with your crazy London bathroom, guess what, can't build it. Yeah. <laughs> or the architect says, you know, Jamie, I like your idea, but I think this is a better way. Great. Like you have to say, I am so excited to hear that and you have to mean it. Yeah, and th- well, there's also a budget side. You know, I've, I've been in meetings where it's like, well, we want this glass elevator going on through the house well, okay, but here's the cause and effect, right? And this is how it changes the structure. And so it's important for us to at least be there to navigate a little bit that North Star to say, hey, there's going to be some cost things. And the client may say, I don't care. Like it's fine, but they may have a big issue with budget. And so, you know, working together, we can help navigate that. Yes, and we have to, and you you know, that's another important thing with the builder designer relationship is that we have that budget conversation at the very beginning. And we know if there's a well to go to if they decide they don't care. And we know if there's not. And that's how we design. So with your company now growing to 13, and that's a lot of people to manage, mm-hmm. and which is hard, and I'm sure that takes a lot of time that we could dive into. But when you think about how much time you focus on design, we spoke about that. You have all your projects, and then you have three to four hours a day that you're focusing on on future design, right? These are images you're taking and you're organizing. So how much a time a week or a month are you actually focused on the business, the stress of running your business? How many hours are in a week? <laughs> <laughs> Minus seven for sleep. There you go. Like literally, that's the answer. I don't have a family. We weren't able to have children. And so this is my baby and it gets a lot of my attention. And I take, um, I will work weekends. I have a little bit of a balance issue <laughs> that we need to work on, but I love it. And it's it's new. I've been doing it for, you know, it'll be eight years in August and I want it to succeed and it's we're on this, you know, exciting trajectory with a steep angle of of growth and I'm just excited about it all the time. Well it's amazing. I think the fun part, you know, seeing from the outside in, I can say seeing you in the last three years and where you're going and what's amazing, I know some of the projects you're working on and some that you and I have together. And I mean these are two years from completion. I mean our you know, our audience will not see this work that you and I are doing for two years, which I'm very impatient. It's hard because I'm like, well, just wait till you see what's upcoming. Once these get photographed and released, I mean, they're, they're amazing. And, and, and there's so much investment from our side. So it's hard to put it down. I know. I know it is. It's so hard to put it down. I mean, you don't, you're always working too, but you have quite a family to balance. So I think that's harder for you, but you seem well, to have it figured out. No, I <laughs> Make it to you, fake it, right? You just, or fake it to you, make it, I should say. Uh, you know, but going back to that, you know, as a business owner, you know, what are some of the things that keep you up at night? Even right now, I mean, the company's grown and you are successful. What would you say are the one or two things that are most stressful about running a company? Well, at night, like, I will think, oh my gosh, did we get back to that client? Or do we get back to that builder? And I'm famous for, like, writing emails in the middle of the night and then sending them in the morning, like, all the time. Um, it stresses me out in the middle of the night. Oh, I forgot I wanted to change, blah, 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 blah. Did we do that? Like, I have a little bit of a crazy memory, which serves me well, but 
not at night. <laughs> um, and I think it's hard to be a creative person, which I am, and also somebody who's running a business which is growing and busy, and to balance those two. They're very different skill sets, and I've had to develop the business side. I'm grateful to my dad for his expertise there, and it's not always easy. It's hard. So how, how much do you stress about forecasting the business development? You know, how, how do you monitor, well, we have this many projects, we're comfortable, we could take more, we could use more, I need to pound the pavement a little bit more and get that phone ringing, you know, how often are you involved or stressed about that element? They say that, my team tells me that like every four or five months I have a, oh my gosh, how many people have, is anybody calling? And we have kind of a, a queue of people waiting, which I'm, that I'm blessed, I am grateful, we aren't worried about projects right now. We know how many we can take on. We've had to hire a few people to manage some that we wanted to keep and take. You know, we calendar three months, four months out so that we know, okay, we can take a project. It can start in August or it can start in June. We really try to make sure that we're not going to disappoint our clients. So we spend a lot of time planning. Um, but at least w- once or twice a year, I have a freak out about if anyone's going to hire me again. But they always do. <laughs> It is. It's stressful. I think the business development and try to monitor that. And I look at it from our side, you know, some of our projects can be, you know, eight months of pre-construction and 16 to 20 months of the build. And so these are two year processes. You know, how do you staff it? How do you manage that cash flow? And then a big part of that too is, well, in construction, I'm sure it's the same for you. And and our system's a little bit different because for design, you're going to have a fee, a deposit, and you're going to bill as you're designing and you're going to capture a majority of your fees up front even though you still have time, a lot of back end time as we get into furnishings and site visits with the contractor. From our side, some of these projects don't go. So it's constantly managing, well, if I turn away this client and this one doesn't go, now I'm in big trouble because we're, we're out the door too, right? That's hard. And so that's the hard part, I think. But it's the same for you. We've had projects that started and then stopped for different reasons and, and you have to navigate around that. You do. And you have to I mean, we always have a few people that we know are wait, waiting and ready, and sometimes they get moved up the list, and that's great. And, you know, that is a luxury that I did not always have. So how much time have you spent on your contract to understand? Because as a designer, if you're working with a client, and a lot of this is trial, you know, you learn as you go. It's trial by fire. So you're going to have a client that may make a 1,000 changes, and you're like, okay, well, how do we safeguard ourselves so that at least for our fee they understand our scope? You know, how... I don't want to say bulletproof, but how much time have you spent on that contract over the years? Well, I really do feel like the universe or God had uh, had it out for me in the beginning and wanted <laughs> me to learn every hard lesson in the first year because I sure did. My first client did not pay me after I finished oh, the no. whole project. For, I mean, I had everything that could go wrong. It has gone wrong, and it went wrong quickly. And I have... Um, so what made you keep going? Hold on, because I think, <laughs> I think we can relate. Now, I can say the same thing. We've had projects that went south, and then... You know, there were some other elements to that, which made it even more complicated. But it's tough as a business to say, should I even be doing this? I questioned myself constantly. But then there was always something new that came that was exciting that got me fired up again. And in the beginning, you know, I was doing this from my spare bedroom. So when the client didn't pay me, yeah, that hurt. But it didn't mean I couldn't pay someone's salary. Mm -hmm. That's, an, you know, especially with the staff of 13, that's a pressure that I feel. And I've it's mounting. And so it's, I am paying a lot more attention to making sure that we will never have to come to our incredibly talented, skilled, wonderful team and say, I'm so sorry, but I, have, I don't want that to happen, mm-hmm. ever. But um, the, the courage to keep going is hard to find. And there were days when I was like crying in my, you know, my husband's <laughs> shoulder, I can't do this. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. But, you know, those days are gone now and I'm gr- glad. And I have a great attorney who's been through that contract, which is always changing with every lesson that we learn. So did you network with other designers as well to understand, you know, their billing structure, payment structure? Yes. So I, when I decided I was going to do this, I worked for another design firm for a couple months and she was incredibly helpful and encouraging. And she, you know, she gave me her contract to use, which I have changed quite a bit, but it was a great place to start. Then I worked with um, Toby Fairley, who is somebody who trains designers professionally. And she helped me learn more about how to bill and how to manage expectations. So I did invest, um, you know, every year 
about $5,000 in training, but I went to people who could train me directly and say, okay, you know these things, here's where you're lacking, here's where you know you could be better, let's work on that. And I still do that. I still have a couple coaches that I go to and I say, okay, we're suffering here, or I think I could be better there, because there's always someone you can learn from. It is, and I love this because part of, from a builder side, and I guess to speak to what you just mentioned, I mean, you had some experience working for another designer, the contract that helped you start, then you have a good attorney, you know, you, you work with a design coach. You know, I look up, we're part of a Builder 20 program, and they do a SWAT, so they come in and they'll bring some of the, the members that are part of our group, they'll come to your office, they'll see your systems, they'll interview your employees, they'll interview your customers, your designers, architects, some of your trades, and then they're very adamant, here's the feedback. Here's what you do good. Here's what you suffer at. Here's what you're lacking. Here's, and it, it's really an emotional experience because, you know, you, you start to see all the things that you think are good that maybe not be because people aren't telling you and you're not seeing it for yourself. Wow, that's amazing. I would love that and probably also cry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't cry that much. I think I've talked about crying a whole lot on this podcast. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm a tough girl. I can't be a designer and not be tough. The other thing, is that, you know, we don't have a formal network like that. But like when I first started my business, after I'd worked for another designer, I didn't have an office. And there was a design firm in town, Valone Design, Donna Valone, who I knew like through a mutual acquaintance who let me have meetings at her office. Like, and I'm like, here I am trying to be your competitor. And I have never forgotten that graciousness. And so when people ask me for help, I give it. And when I need help, I ask for it. And I found that the design community, especially here in Phoenix, we're all friends. We help each other. We know that what we're doing is hard and we're managing big money and big clients and we need each other. Sometimes you just need to call somebody and be like, oh my gosh, I had the worst day and talk to somebody who completely understands. So it is so valuable. And it's funny. I, there's a couple of builders I speak to. In fact, Nick uh, Schiffer, who was on last week and then Johnny, who was on a while ago. And it's funny because we talk about, you know, you think everything's perfect from far away and then you realize we're all dealing with the same issues and, you know, whether it be budgets or manpower or, you know, labor and, and all these things are really tough to navigate. So how, how do you feel it's been for you in the contracting world? It's a tough industry. How does it compare to journalism? Is, is one harder than the other? I think that this is easier. Really? Yes, I do. I do. But it's e- design is easy for me. And so like, again, I'm always like, what was I thinking with the, <laughs> with the journalism, even though I loved it. And when I someday write a coffee table book, I'll be so glad that I did it. But it is easy for me. The harder part is managing clients and managing expectations and managing staff. And that's been the part that I've had to work on and develop. That is, is tough. Yeah. And it, it's tough to get a system down where you're always on the same page because things come up that you can't always catch. You know, but it's interesting. And I, I would imagine since you're so passionate about design, then it's easier you enjoy going to work. And I'm sure you don't miss being in this political climate trying to do journalism right now. And it's a little more challenging now than, you know, years ago. It's a, it's a little bit different environment. And I'm sure all of us are trying to navigate. Going back to your Facebook comment, you know, some of us maybe not be, we're not on Facebook as much just to avoid some of the chaos that's out there. Yes. I mean, we, we keep a politic-free zone in our <laughs> office because, you know, we have clients of all different walks of life. So we don't like to talk about that either. But it is this is this is much easier for me than journalism. Yeah, and, and I don't miss it. Which people are like, "Don't you miss being a reporter? You got to do such cool things." I'm like, "Nope, not ever." But see, if you're not passionate about it, I mean, business is tough. Life is tough, right? And you have to have a passion behind it to be successful. So, what's the least favorite part? I should say about design. I mean, you love every element we discussed, but is there a part you're not as excited about? I do not love tile. <laughs> No one believes me because you're like, you you, you do such great tile. I'm like, I well, know. thank you. No, it is. I do not love tile. I hate grout. I hate cleaning. Like, you know, yuck. Um, I really am a classicist at heart. And people bring me like tile inlaid with gold. And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> I don't want to do that. So I I don't love it. But it is something that we have gotten a name for, which is hilarious to me. But I spend a lot of time making sure that our choices are classic and they've been around for a long time. They are classic, and I've and I've noticed you've you've mentioned you know to some of your clients, you know when they want to go maybe a wild, not a wild direction, but maybe a direction that's you know a little out there that you're like, well, let's look at certain elements that are hard to replace, right? So what are some of those that you really focus on and say, let's stay a little bit more conservative or classic here, but we can have fun here? 
Yes. So that is important to me. And we want our clients, we, we talk about resale, even though they think they're going to live in this house for 15 years, I want to have their back in terms of a smart investment. So I say, okay, let's bust a move with wallpaper. Let's bring it with the lighting. That is so easy to fix. But like, maybe let's not do like crazy countertops that are like blue marble, or maybe let's not, you know, do cabinets that are not going to stand the test of time. Let's really focus on having fun in places that are easy to change. Cabinet hardware, great place. <laughs> yeah, cabinet hardware, lighting, wallpaper, accent walls, or mirrors. maybe furniture, mirrors. I mean, mirrors. these are things that can easily be be swapped out. Backsplashes are easy to change out. Showers, no, because you want to be mud setting those. And yeah. So. That's interesting with the tile. So when you speak about tile, because you do a phenomenal job with your tile accent walls and the mud work and the showers. So would you prefer if the budget was always available to do slab in the showers in lieu of tile? No, I just... Don't no, not actually, because I do enjoy it, but I feel or is like, it more just flooring like throughout the house? I don't know what it is. It's just like when it's time for all the bathrooms. I mean, I design. I don't even know hundreds of bathrooms a year, and I'm like, oh my gosh, here we are again with the tile and the bathrooms. But I think tile stresses people out a little bit, clients, because they see the new new thing, and I don't want them to choose the new new thing, and I'm not going to show them the new thing. I want to show them something that is going to stand the test of time. And there's also so much of it. You know, there are only so many countertops available in the world, and there's only so many faucets available in the world. But there's a lot of tile. There is a lot of tile. And they want to see it all. (laughs) And it's hard to put that together. Well, you've been amazing, Jamie, and I think you just have so much to offer. I can't thank you enough for coming on. You've been uh, you know, extremely talented, as we mentioned. You have some amazing projects, and I know our listeners are going to love following you after this episode. You know, so what's upcoming and exciting for Jamie Rose Interiors? Well, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. This was a bucket list item, and I'm really excited to be here. But we have a project with you, which is going to blow minds. <laughs> I mean, it's so crazy. There's a lazy river and a tennis court and a trampoline barn. I mean, it's epic and it's very inspired by all those crazy hotels in Europe and the clients were brave and it's really fun. I'm so excited for that. We, as I mentioned, have um, now projects in Lake Tahoe and in Greenwich, Connecticut, which is a horse property that, you know, we're channeling major Ralph Lauren. And we have a project on the California coast that um, there's a few oceanfront lots that the client bought that we're building on. So, I mean, we're going a little global, which is fun who wants to pay me to build an apartment in paris (laughs) please (laughs) everyone needs a business trip to paris and london they do it's a total (laughs) write-off i know my wife's a huge fan of london and i know that you are as well jamie and so when you post the photo she's like oh i want to go back like she if if we can move to london tomorrow she'd go in a heartbeat it is so inspiring there's so much design there and so diverse such a diverse culture it's a really fun place to go sometime we ne- i told her that we need to go together yeah we it's funny because she lived there she did study abroad you know she lived there before we met and having gone back there with her to paris and london you know those it's so inspiring those cities and as you mentioned you walk around in awe looking at the buildings and the architecture and you go in these restaurants and shops and they're so different and you know, there there is a lot of inspiration. I know from a design side because she loves design as you as do you. And you know, there's so much inspiration to gather from some of those cities that have stood the test of time. Yeah, and totally. And what's so fun about Europe is that they have this these buildings that have been there for hundreds of years, much much older than our buildings in the, in the United States, and they're pairing it with crazy contemporary design, and or even just a little bit of a twist and that juxtaposition is what's creating the excitement and joy in that design. So yeah, to see see. some of that classic architecture, it's more traditional and then you come in, it's ultra modern. It's crazy to see that contrast and how they blend it. It's so fun to see and just total eye candy for us as designers. So where can our listeners find you? We are on Instagram, which is at Jamie Rose interiors and it is spelled crazy. So thank you mom for that. (laughs) It's J A I M E E which annoys me daily, but I love you, mom. And then I, uh, website is jamierose.com. Well, it's funny. Every time I text you or email you, uh, I always make sure that my spell check doesn't go to one E cause I don't want to offend you. So, Oh no, <laughs> I would, I mean, most people's does and I'm have to be okay with it. <laughs> well, again, Jamie, thank you again. All of you listeners, make sure you check her out on some of her amazing work. She's extremely talented. And so thank you for your time. Thank you, Brad.